Today's episode is an interview with Ohio pharmacist Dave Bitkowski. Dave is an advocate for his daughter Melissa and her rare kidney disease, GPA, granulomatosis with polyangiitis. He is also a pharmacist entrepreneur who provides entertainment in the form of air gun targets. You're listening to the Pharmacist Voice Podcast, a journey style podcast about my career change from pharmacist to voice actor. I'm your host, Kim Newlove. I alternate solo shows and interview shows. The solo shows are about my career change and the interview shows feature a variety of people who use their voices to advocate, educate, or entertain. I'm a pharmacist and voice actor who specializes in medical narration and e-learning. If you have a project in mind, contact me through my website, thepharmacistvoice.com. That's thepharmacist, with an S, voice.com. Thank you for joining me for episode 17. I'll give you some background on my guest, Dave Bitkowski, and how he uses his voice. Then we'll dive right into the interview. Dave Bitkowski graduated from the University of Toledo College of Pharmacy with his Bachelor of Science degree in 1995. He is a long-term care pharmacist in Northwest Ohio. Dave founded RX Target Systems in 2017. RX Target Systems is a premium target manufacturing business for airsoft guns and air guns. I invited Dave on the podcast because he advocates, educates, and entertains. Dave's daughter, Melissa, has a rare kidney disease called granulomatosis with polyangiitis, also known as GPA, and he is her advocate. To help with the costs of her care and to have a creative outlet, Dave used his air gun hobby to launch a business. He educates air gunners that a simple tool, like his targets, can enhance skill without costing a lot of money. RX Target Systems' mission is not only to enhance air gun marksmanship skills, but also to increase pediatric kidney disease awareness. He fits into the entertainment category because his product entertains air gun enthusiasts at home and in competition. Products sold by RX Target Systems have earned favorable reviews by leaders in the air gun sporting industry. For example, the Pyramid Air Cup Speed Shooting Competition featured RX Target Systems in 2019. RX target systems are also used on quality assurance ranges at corporations such as UTG, Crossman, and Umarex. Dave Bitkowski is a pharmacist entrepreneur with a great story. Without further ado, here's my interview with Dave Bitkowski. Welcome to the Pharmacist Voice podcast, Dave. How are you? I am doing great. Thank you for having me on. My pleasure. I invited you on the show because you are an advocate for your daughter and her rare kidney disease, as well as a pharmacist entrepreneur who provides entertainment in the form of air gun targets. The two are connected. Can you tell me first about your daughter and her rare kidney disease? Then tell me about how the air gun targets fit into her story. Yeah, um, our daughter, Melissa, she's now 10 years old. Uh, but the age of six and a half, and while in the first grade, she was diagnosed with a um, a very rare kidney disorder, kidney disease um, called GPA, which is actually a rheumatological disorder that um, happened to target her kidneys. Uh, it's called uh, GPA is short for granulomatosis polyangiitis. Um, What it is, is a type of vasculitis or inflammation of the blood vessels. And this particular type actually targets the small and medium-sized blood vessels. And what it does, it causes an inflammation of the cells, which is called granuloma. Um, And when that happens, it, it interferes with the circulation of the blood going through the body to the organ systems with the oxygen so when that when you have disruption of blood flow to any of the organ systems, it, it causes disruption of the organ system, and it, it can affect the uh, um, most commonly affects the lung, sinuses, and kidneys, but it can also affect the eyes, ears, skin, nerves, joints, and organs. Hers actually um, seem to be localized to her kidneys, and. 
the rarity of it is something we weren't even familiar with. I never even heard of um, granulomatosis, probably NGI, when I was going through pharmacy school 25 years ago. <laughs> um, it's three, in a, the rarity is three in a hundred thousand. And it's not typically in kids. It's typically in people age 40 to 65. Um, so we were totally caught off guard. The, uh, it's diagnosed basically is diagnosis is on biopsy of a tissue. So we had to have a renal biopsy done in order to positively diagnose it. Uh, turns out we were the second case in 15 years uh, in the area. Um, and it was diagnosed. The initial diagnosis was done by the same nephro, not pediatric nephrologist here in Toledo, Ohio. Um, so when Melissa was six and a half uh, in first grade, she couldn't even swallow a pill. But she was smart enough to alert us that her urine looked funny. And she brought that to our attention. I looked at it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, these are really bad urinary tract infection, which led us to the doctor's office. And they looked at it and said, oh, my gosh, this, this doesn't look normal, obviously but they weren't quite sure. And there was a lot of blood in there. There was some white blood cells and it was dark, um, almost, you know. So, you know, they said that if she pees like this again, get her to the emergency room. And of course that happened the following Monday. This was on a Friday and we ended up in the emergency room. Everything just went from there. Um, Melissa, she, she uh, since then is, you know, she's had a transplant and she's done extremely well. The attitude that she had through this ordeal has been amazing. You know, kind of admirable for such a tragedy or you know thing to have happened to you at that age. The target business, you know, eventually it became tied in. I was working on an idea at the time before the diagnosis of. Um, I was, you know, into air guns pretty heavily and I was tired of shooting, um, targets that would end up in the trash or not be able to be reused. And I started making targets and looked at this maybe could be a business someday. The, the push never came until, uh, we found out what was going on and the enormous stress of dealing with a critical illness with a ch child at this age that we really very knew, knew very little about the disease, the progression or anything. Um, that stress kind of pushed me into, I need an outlet. You know, some people play music, some people work out, some people draw. I mean, I was working out, but I also found that this was an even tougher challenge of making air gun targets. So it became a creative outlet for me to deal with the stress. Eventually, as we'll you know get into later, is, is how it intertwines with the awareness of pediatric kidney disease. Dave, when we were getting to know one another, you told me that the kidney donor testing process is like astronaut testing in terms of the labs and the physical exams. What can you tell me about the donor process and the testing and the transplant day itself? Yeah. Um, so with the donor process, you, you have to go through what's called a match, matching system, and where not only you're, you, you have to have the right blood type, but it, more importantly, it's the tissue, the tissue or the HLA um, typing that's important. So in other words, we had living donors. Um, we were going through both routes, a living donor and a deceased donor, whichever we can um, obtain more easily um, and efficiently. So we started going through the living donor process because we had myself and my wife's cousin that were interested in uh, as candidates. So you have to go through a, a day class where it's all instruction so you can make an informed decision if you really want to go through with this. Um, they talk about everything from the type of diet that you should be eating. You can't be 
you have to be in good shape. You can't be, um, have high, anything that's like red flags in terms of heart disease, kidney disease, and um, so forth. But they also talked a lot about, you know, preparing you to be ready socially and economically. Um, just because you're a match doesn't match with the tissue typing, doesn't make you a match overall as the best option. Um, you don't have to be a hundred percent match. You just have to be a good match for it to, for it to be successful. Um, so for example, if you were the breadwinner for the family, such as I, um, we, I had to go to work every day. So, um, if I would donate the kidney, I would have to miss work for, um, up to six months or so many weeks before, um, it was extended period of time before I could go back to work, stand on my feet and do, do, um, the job. Um, your pharmacy isn't extremely rigorous, but can you imagine if you were a construction worker, you would be out much longer, um, depending on how your employment is set up with, um, FMLA and, and so forth. And your financial situation was that may not be the best option for you to do. Whereas somebody else in the family was, was also a match and they could afford to stay home. Um, they didn't, or they didn't have a full-time job or they weren't the principal breadwinner in a house. So there was a whole, basically a whole psychological and socioeconomic analysis that you had to do of yourself um, that they taught us, uh, you know, to make that decision. Um, so when, as we were going through this, um, we wouldn't find out if we were a match until we went through some of these tests, um, because it takes a while for the, the results to come back. But we had to go through, um, a complete physical, complete blood work. They test for viruses, um, and and so and you know viruses like the rh factors and stuff like that uh we had to go through renal function testing like very rigorous um where you do a t collection and you have to um urinate every so many minutes they're giving you as they're giving you um fluids to see how well your kidneys function then you have to do imaging scans of your kidneys to see how the the um, dye, uh, there's radioactive imaging, dye circulated through your kidneys and uh, to make sure it was healthy uh, an organ that you could, A, that you could donate, but B, you had to make sure that if you did give a kidney up, that the kidney, the existing kidney you had was able to function uh, when, if you donated. Because what happens is your kidney function will go from, what, 90 to 100% down to half initially because you don't have the kidney function that you did if you had two kidneys initially. So your kidney that you're left with, um, just to simplify it down, has to catch up. And it does catch up. It just doesn't do it right away. So if you had poor kidney, your, your kidney function wasn't as good going into it and you decided to donate, you may not um, recover as well or be the best candidate for it. So they had to make sure your kidney function was as good as it can be. Um, now, as far as the transplant day, we, we decided that it was going to be the cousin that did the donor. And the funniest part about it is, you know, both of us would have worked, but um, from a socioeconomic standpoint, it was not as beneficial for me to do, to be the donor um, because if something would have happened, um, God forbid something goes wrong and, I can't go back to work and things happen, you know? So the funny thing though, is our daughter, Melissa, she's like, dad, I want a woman's kidney. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I like, rather have a girl kidney. And he, this is, this is at this point, she's seven and a half years old. You know, I mean, like she just had the greatest outlook on it, you know? And so, and I wasn't offended. I'm like, all for you, you know? Um, now transplant day, uh, everybody talks about big sporting events the night before having a jitters. This was the way this was, was, it was almost surreal. I mean, I've never been so nervous in my entire life and, and it wasn't even me going under the, on the operating table. Um, it was highly emotional. 
and we just knew that this was it was it was out of our hands at that time for the uh, for what was going to happen. It was all in God's hands and all in the surgeon's hands. And so the night before, we said we're just going to chill out. You know, we're just going to go out to eat. We had a nice dinner. She got to eat whatever she wanted. We'd have to have dialysis the next day because we were going on. You know, she was getting a new kidney, so he could have. You know, she could relax the diet. So we're the kidney transplant day. They take the donor in first, and they're in separate parts of the hospital. She's in the adult side, and Melissa's in the um, pediatric side. So we we get the word that you know the the donor is out of um, is out of surgery, and so we start walking to her where she's at on the recovery side, and as we're walking through the corridor, we see the we see a, a team of doctors going by, and they're carrying a cooler, and we'll never forget it. It was like. It was this surreal, and we're like, "Oh my God, is that her kidney that's going on to her now?" You know, and I think the whole world stopped for a minute, and I get choked up talking about it every time. But it just seemed like everything stopped. It's like a miracle being delivered, right? Yeah, yeah, it was incredible, just incredible. But you know, and then. I don't know how many hours later, we're just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. It's like you're on pins and needles. And uh, we get the word that she's out of of the recovery room and they call us over. And we started the surgeon walking down the hallway. And uh, everything was like slow motion. And uh, and then he said everything went good. So it was was fantastic. It was fantastic. And my God, sorry, I'm getting choked up. But (laughs) it was was amazing and like we we got to go in the operating room or in the in the room up in icu uh, and we saw a bag that was hanging on the bed i'm like oh my gosh it's filling up (laughs) she was making urine already wow (laughs) and i mean she was making urine i've never been so excited to see urine in my life (laughs) and it was clear it was it was great looking urine compared to what we were seeing before so. Well, it'd probably been a whole year at least since she had had a normal urine stream, right? Well, you know, it's funny because there's two types of renal. There's is aneuric and oliguric renal failure. And she was oliguric. She produced urine. It was the most puzzling case that it was baffling. A lot of things about her case the, were not normal. That just it just kind of like we just kind of like looked at stuff and said, "What? Well, that's not what the, it's not textbook." You know, she just wasn't she wasn't your textbook case, and yeah, she she always produced urine. It's just she was it was we called it dumb urine, dumb urine, high creat, elevated potassium, high phos. You know, but they look you wouldn't know that by looking at it. Well, it sounds like she's very lucky that you advocated so hard for her to get diagnosed and the treatments that she needed, the kidney transplant. And I understand that she had the actual transplant on a very lucky day. Can you tell me about that? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was uh, July 11th and 7-11. And we actually, we had like choices when we could do it because it was a living donor. And they had these dates set up, and she wanted that date. And so 7-Eleven um, was, was it. And the funny thing is, is like, we could all went to, we could all got free, uh, free freezies at 7-Eleven that day, but we weren't able to because we didn't leave the hospital. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, uh, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was a good day. How old is Melissa now, and how many years have passed since that kidney transplant? Um, uh, she's 10, and now um, it'll be two years on July 11th. Well, thank God that she got that kidney. That's a happy ending. I'm a big fan yeah. of happy endings. Good for her. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was It was uh, very, very happy. It was so thankful. It, it was a struggle um, with everything that we went through just to get there. 
Now, what's life like now for Melissa and your whole family? I mean, how does this affect your family? What's your new normal look like? Um, yeah, the you know, the, the new normal is we live by an alarm clock. Every 12 hours, um, we take a handful of pills. And, you know, that's something that definitely gets you on a schedule. Um, is that for organ rejection? Yeah, we take tra- anti-rejection. Yeah, we take the mycophenolate. We take the tacro. We take the Bactrim. Uh, we have to take iron, vitamin D. Um, and we have to take like a, um, a medication for the upset stomach because the drugs are really hard on the stomach. Um, so we take that. And, uh, you know, it's just very regimented and... There's labs we have to get done. We had uh, initially your appointments are every week. Um, and then, but now we're at the part where it's every month that we have to go um, for the appointment. There's blood pressure, temperature checks, fluid goals. Uh, just because you have a kidney now doesn't mean you don't have to take care of it. You still have to maintain, make sure you're getting enough fluids in and, if you don't, and that kidney gets dehydrated, you take a chance of having major problems. So we have to be really careful with that. Um, we have, uh, for example, with school, uh, you know, she has to make sure she drinks fluids during the day. She has to be able to go to the bathroom whenever she needs to because she's drinking so much fluids. And so that's just like, you know, having discussions with the counselors and with the teachers every year. Um, so they're aware of what GPA is and how it affects a child in your class. Um, sometimes they may not ha- they may not be able to concentrate for long periods of time, which is hard for a child to do anyways. But with GPA, it can be more difficult. Um, and when you're uh, living by a clock every 12 hours, if you're having sleepovers, you're at your friend's house and you get distracted. You got to, you know, make sure that the parents they're going to know that she has pills she has to take at eight o'clock, you know, at night for, you know, before things get out of hand. But the thing is, you got to make sure they eat. If they don't eat, they can throw up, you know, and then if you throw up within so many minutes of taking the pills, you may or may not have to repeat the dose. (laughs) You know, it's just a whole ball of wax that, you know, you never thought you would have to deal with. And she's really, she's really good about it. Well, let me ask you, with the exception of the COVID-19 status that we're all experiencing across the U.S. right now, is she allowed to go to a typical school and be among her peers? Yeah. um, Yeah. Before that, what, what she had to um, wear a mask for so long after initially after the transplant. Uh, And then if anybody's, anybody's sick, that uh, comes into class, she has to wear a mask or not be around them. Um, just be so, you know, so far apart. Uh, if there's like a, say like they have chicken pox outbreak or there's so many cases of the flu that we're notified, um, we have to make sure she's washing her hands every day. She has access to hand sanitizer at her desk, all that stuff. And... Um, the school, the school has been really good with us. We have a really good relationship with them and their teachers with dealing with stuff like that. Because if you have a child that in, comes in and, you know, your, your kid's fine, but they come in and they they have the flu or they're sick or there's a chicken pox outbreak, the normal kid, maybe that's okay. But if you don't have an immune system that can mount an adequate response efficiently enough, then that's a big issue. So we have to, you know, just be careful with that. Okay. And now how about sports and playing? Is she able to run and play and jump and um, do non-contact oh yeah, sports? Yeah. yeah, we can't do we can't do contact sports um, at all uh, where there's striking involved. Because when you have a kidney transplant, which, you know, I didn't even realize, you're, the kidney is actually put in the front of the body. It's put right in the lower abdomen, o- oblique area, you know, down there. It's not put in the back. Now, like if you're playing softball, you have to wear a guard 
you have to wear a guard because if you get hit by a pitch, then that area can be very dangerous. Um, so we can't do contact sports. Well, that's that. a small price to pay. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to change the subject a little bit. How has your background as a pharmacist helped you and your family navigate your daughter's kidney disease? Um, you know, it, it, you might you probably hear this a lot. It's like a double-edged sword. You're, you have so much knowledge about the medical side of it, you know, um, which is extremely useful when you're advocating for a family member. Um, but at the same time, it is difficult because you know what can happen. You actually, you know so much that you're, you're afraid in a way. Um, but what, at the same time, you already know the medications that she's on, that she's coming home with. You can learn about them rapidly, um, rather than somebody having to like spoon feed it to you or go over it with you in great detail. Uh, you know, like having to take blood pressures every day, having to take temperatures every day, that sort of thing. And, and navigating the insurance and transplant drugs that you can't get, like with our insurance, we have to get through a specialty pharmacy. And I'm like, so you have to get through the mail. You can't, you, you know what I mean? It's being a pharmacist and having to see other patients deal with it. Now it's you deal, dealing with it. <laughs> You're on the other side, and it just it's just kind of like a, you do it you just do a 360 on everything. And when we did rounds, um, the doctors encouraged family rounds. So we, you know, I, I participated and I translated to my wife and uh, family. My daughter wanted nothing to do with rounds. She just blocked everything out. You know, she didn't want to know. She just, she wanted to know when she went, she could go home and if she was going to die. It was the only thing she cared about. She said, am I going to die? And when can I go home? Oh, dear. Yeah, it was that. It just, she just did not want to, you know, she blocked it out. And, and she, you know, it was kind of hard to see. But being able to provide input as a, as a clinician, you know, was something that, was important to me. Uh, we, we had a uh, really difficult time stabilizing the blood pressure and we ended up in and out of the ICU, uh, three to four times. Come to find out it, the average patient with a GPA, um, is in the ICU three to four times before they get a handle on it because there's so many different organ systems, so many different factors that are involved. And ours, our particular one was blood pressure. Uh, we couldn't get the blood pressure under control. We had to find the right combination of pills. She started having seizures um, because the blood pressure got so high. The seizures were witnessed right there at the hospital. And so we knew that we had to get it under control. And so I was able to talk with the doctor, the nephrologist, about blood pressure medications. What could we try? And then I listened to what their suggestions were. They, mean, they, they were experts in blood pressure management. And if you know anybody that's a, a nephrologist, they are experts in blood pressure management and control because the blood vessels in the kidneys are so small that a little effect makes a big effect, has a big, big weight. And so they tend to do things very methodically. As a pharmacist, you know, I, I had a hard time moving that slow. I wanted things done now, 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 <laughs> but that's not the way it works. And um, so as a, being a double-edged sword is like, I knew what the risks were. I knew what the odds were of a, of a child presenting with X amount of renal function and with this diagnosis and what the likelihood for needing a transplant was, you know. Um, and that kind of kind of made me mad because I knew that stuff. <laughs> and, I, and I was learning it. And I tried not to read. They tell, tell you, don't read. Um, don't read. I tried not to read it, but I had to know, you know. And, it's, it's kind of the curse yeah. of knowledge. Yes. Yes. And, you know, but it was good. And, you know, we, we learned a lot about the disease and her case and learned how to move forward with it. Well, I think you're doing an excellent job. I, I don't know if people tell you enough, but you're doing a great job. Thank you. 
Thank you. It's like, you know, we feel my wife leaves up me handling all the medications. So I, I fill her med boxes every morning or every week. Um, and then my wife takes care of the social aspect and, you know, making sure she has everything she needs for school. They got the letters to the, the teachers and nurses and we know who the teacher is. We know their number. We know the school nurse. We know when she's there and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. You've got a lot of great things going for you. You're doing a great job. But I was just curious, what's one of the biggest challenges that you've had? Um, you know, the biggest challenges for was the, for the family in general with living a new normal and the restrictions that we had to go through um, of not being able to go on vacation, not being able to leave the house, not being able to enjoy going to a restaurant, going to a movie theater, uh, because there's too many people there and you had to wait so many days or months before you could actually do that. Um, for the family thing, that was the hardest. I, the hardest thing for me was learning how to be a dad before, before being a pharmacist. Um, because, you know, you have to, you have to be strong for your daughter and forget about the medical stuff. And that was the hardest thing for me to do. You know, so like the, the reality check was when we went into the checkup and we had to uh, find out if the, the round of chemo had worked because they have to repeat a biopsy after so long once you start the chemo to see if it's working to remain, um, if we're going to remain on dialysis or if we're going to be able to come off dialysis. And we had to end up switching drugs halfway through, but the second round, after we even tried the second agent, it, uh, we got the news that it failed. And she only had about one third of her kidney function left. And meaning that we needed a transplant to survive, um, to be able to get off dialysis. And to look at your daughter in the eye and tell her that, you know, you, we, we lost one war, but we're not going to lose the next and maintain that positive attitude. That's called being a dad. And, and that was, that was the hardest thing to do, you know, but we had to do it and we made it. Yes, you did. It's hard to find people you trust and listen to them and just have that faith, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, we the doctors there were the best, you know. They were just the absolute best. And they were really concerned about the well-being of the family as well, you know, which is what you need. It's not just it's not just healing a child. It's, it's healing the family, too. And they gave us access to anything that we needed to do that. I like that outlook, you know, that's a yeah. holistic approach for the family and the child. That's wonderful. Yeah. They, it's, they, you know, they ask us every day if we, social workers talk to us every day um, and when we needed to, you know, to make sure things were okay. And, you know, I took a month off of work and my employer was just amazing. You know, I mean, I didn't lose my job. So that was was I was most worried about not being able to keep a job because I had to take time off and my wife had to my wife had to quit her job um, as she was a pharmacy technician and she actually had to quit her job to, to stay home to take care of things that's just the way we we made that decision that that's what we were going to do I give your wife a lot of credit too I've been in that position too where I've had to stay at home with the child that needed me and my hat goes off to her too yeah, yeah, it was, it was tough. Well, in the midst of your daughter's illness, you started this side business, or right as she was uh, becoming sick. Can you tell me about RX Target Systems, the company, the product, and what you hope to do with the money you earn? Yeah, so um, we kind of alluded to this at the beginning. I started uh, making air gun targets in March of 20th, uh, like December. 
2015 or 2016. And the we got the diagnosis when we were in March. It was St. Patrick's Day. Um, I can remember it to the day. And so the targets were just something to do for fun at that point. And as things went on, it was like, I need to make extra money. I need to find a way to make extra money um, to start bringing some extra income in to help pay the bills. And I already had a target system started. Um, it just nobody really seen it. And I showed it to some peers in the industry and they kind of really encouraged me to do it. We um, decided to go forward with that to bring some extra money in and so RX Target Systems was born in March of 2017. They uh, had two missions, and one was to uh, provide a skill-enhancing skill enhancing shooting system for the shooting sports uh, sportsmen and, and people just getting into shooting to help improve their uh, marksmanship. The second, I wanted to use it as an avenue to raise awareness to GPA and pediatric kidney disease. Um, it became very apparent that this was going to be a part of me for the rest of my life and the rest of our lives. And I wanted to be able to start a business that could bring awareness to that. We had bracelets made. We had T-shirts made. Um, I think my first 50 or 50 orders I got sent out, everybody got bracelets, um, GPA awareness bracelets. Um, they got a, we have my, the story of our daughter is on our webpage, the business webpage. There is a, um, link to educational material on there. And there's also a link to a, a fund that we set up in our daughter's name at the university of Michigan to help the social workers, um, with patients who are in dialysis. So we set that up and, so Argus Heart Systems is, is kind of a holistic approach. Um, we're going to help shooters shoot better, and we're going to raise awareness to pediatric kidney disease at the same time. That's how, that's how it got started. Very cool. Can you tell me about the air guns that you use uh, to shoot at the targets? Is that a hobby that you've had for years, or how'd you get started in that? Yeah, so I started, I started shooting air guns in 2006. Um, just I wanted something to do. And as I just started buying the basic pellet gun, and, uh, you know, at Myers or Walmart or whatever. And then I got into the more powerful stuff. Um, the air guns that you guys might be thinking of are like the Daisy Red Rider, uh, might be a Crosman 760 uh, basic pellet gun. I'm thinking and, of Ralphie on A Christmas yeah, Story. <laughs> yeah, and we and all of us in the industry joke about it. Don't shoot your eye out. Don't shoot your eye out. You know. Um, yeah, we do have those, but to the gate today's air guns have become a sporting tool for competition and hunting, and they're more powerful than they were 20 years ago. They're more powerful than they were three years ago. The industry has come so far to the um, as towards trying to legalize hunting in all 50 states with air guns. And there's a whole organization called the Air Gun Sporting Association that was um, set up to help raise awareness to legal, ethical hunting with air guns in the states. And um, their job is educating and um, lobbying with legislators to get get the law changed and also to help uh, regulate some of the uh, competition in sports. And one of them, which is the bench rest where you shoot paper at a uh, hundred yards, 25 yards, 75 yards. Um, they actually have rules set up and you do that. Now, when we all grew up with air guns growing up, did you ever think that you could earn money? shooting air guns no <laughs> well the the person the biggest tournament is thirty five thousand dollars total in cash and prizes wow yeah yes so i mean there's there's money to be made if you're in the shooting air guns at sport um for example shooting shooting uh 
a hundred a paper at a hundred yards, you know, shooting twenty five bullseyes at a hundred yards with the highest score, you can win, you know, seven thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. You know, and you we we growing up we never thought we could do that with air guns. It wasn't even thought of. Are you selling your no. targets at these events? Uh yeah. Um I actually the there's there's different type of air gun events. Um there's field target there's bench rest and there is what's called speed shooting. Um, my targets are for the tournaments right now are geared for speed shooting where you, uh, so I actually made targets for an event called the pyramid air gun cup, which is in Columbus, Ohio. And they have the event every year. Last year was the first year that I did it. Um, what was unique about it is that targets that I made were the first resettable speed targets used in that level of competition in the United States. Um, what it did, it, it cut their, cut their competition time in half because you could have guys shooting targets and not having to walk out there and pick everything back up. They just had to walk up their pool lever and they all reset. Um, so yeah, so I make, I make targets for, for competition and it also makes targets for recreation uh so you can you can shoot at home you can shoot in the backyard you can shoot on a range where can people find out more about these targets or buy them if they're interested yeah so i we have a website rxtargetsystems.com and it's quite a um there's a lot of information on there a lot of educational stuff there's uh Facebook page, which is the uh, RX Target Systems by David A. Bitkowski. There's the Instagram page, which is our RX Target Systems, RX Target Systems. There's a Twitter, um, which is at Systems RX. And I have a YouTube channel as well. Um, we're going to be uh, on TV as well. Uh, the Target System on American Air Gunner. If, American Air Gunner TV is the only television show dedicated to air guns on cable. It airs in the U.S. and Canada. And um, so we have a system that will be on there airing on the upcoming season. It's called the American Air Gunner uh, Challenge Championships or American Air Gunner Championships uh, Challenge here. Yeah can't speak challenge series where it's 10 weeks of air gun shooting competition and the winner at the end whoever has the most points at the end of the 10 weeks um, wins so it's american air gunner championships and we actually have our own week dedicated on that show that'll be airing um uh, in the upcoming months i don't have an exact date yet your targets will be on that tv show yeah awesome yeah. For yeah, one it's, whole it's, week. Uh, it'll be, yeah, it has its own episode. It's, there's, I think it's, there's, there's 10 different events and I think they do one each week. So it'll be, it'll have its own episode. Well, congratulations. That's great exposure. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It, it's, it all happened by, you know, by chance really. And it, he, he's, it caught the targets caught his attention, the producer's attention, um, Rossi Morielli, and uh, he saw him. He's like, "Wow, so I, I want, I think I want to use your stuff in my show." <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you better start making more targets. You're the one that makes them, right? Might be yeah. selling some after that, huh? <laughs> A lot more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, remarkably, um, the stay-at-home orders have. Um, been really good to like sporting companies who like sell basketball hoops, um, BB guns, air guns, targets. I mean, everybody stay at home. They need something to do. And I mean, I've been really busy and you know, my, I, I'm setting up vendors, um, across the country. That's my goal is to get, you know, get into the vendors now. Um, so I'm not retailing out of my house or out of my garage. It's actually going through a, a channel. Um, so I already have a few set up for that, but yeah, it's been, it's been busy. 
So you'll be able to handle the flood of orders coming your way once this is televised, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a, you know, I have a, um, a welder, a plasma cutter. Um, he's a commercial welder. He has a big table and we can cut like uh, 50 something target plates at one time. Sounds like you're all set. It'd be a challenge for sure. What we're doing is uh, we're, you know, with air gun targets is the air guns have become so powerful that there aren't targets for them. They're, they have to shoot firearms targets and, and you shouldn't have to shoot a firearms target that you don't need. Um, you don't need AR 500 steel, which is like the standard with a firearms target. An air gun round is much softer and it doesn't have the velocity as a firearm does. What I found with testing is it's the velocity striking a, a target that it does the damage. Um, it's not just the, the amount of energy hits it. It's a combination of things, but velocity has a lot of effect when it hits something. And so what, what users have been left to do, they, they're, they're buying firearms targets or they're buying the air gun targets of five, 10 years ago that aren't strong enough to withstand the energies that these, the today's air guns have. So I come in to fill that gap. I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, that that's the welcomed, a welcome thing in the industry. You will see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so far it's been okay, you know? Oh, good. Well, congratulations on your success. What do you love most about what you're doing with the RX target systems? Um, you know, I, I love educating people and showing them um, that a, t- a simple tool can enhance your skill and it doesn't have to cost a million bucks. Um, and I love the fact that, you know, but the peers in the industry now are recognizing um, what I'm doing. Um, they've always been welcome to what I'm, what, what was going on. And the, uh, we're all like a commodity. It's a nice camaraderie between the group. And we all push each other to to succeed. And, you know, we don't, you know, like in some areas of business where it's the top dog gets the, you know, gets everything. It's not always that way in the air gun world. I mean, we're all in it together to advance the sport um, in the most effective way possible. And you cannot do that if you have the ego that I'm better than everybody else. We're all working together. And that's one of the best things I love about it. Um, and second, that I can use my background as a pharmacist and incorporate it into making air gun targets because in a way you're dispensing knowledge and you're dispensing something that could help people in a form of an air gun target. And at the same time, um, going to be able to raise awareness to pediatric kidney disease. I'm glad you brought that up, the connection with the pediatric kidney disease. Yeah. Because you mentioned to me off the air that you have some part of your website that's devoted to your daughter's story and raising money right. for that fund that you set up. Do you want to talk about that right. for a second? Yeah, yeah. So on our webpage is rxtargetsystems.com. There's a page that's dedicated to pediatric kidney disease. And it has, a, um, has the bio of our daughter, our story, and also... Um, uh, links to a couple links to some educational material on GPA and pediatric kidney disease. And there's a fund on there that it's a tax exempt fund for donating. And the money goes directly to the support, the social workers at the university of Michigan's pediatric dialysis unit, their pediatric nephrology unit. And that we set that fund up for a specific purpose. Um, as we were going through this process, we did not live in a state of Michigan. We were from Ohio. And that presents a whole challenge to itself where we immediately went down to a single family income instead of a, a double family income. And we were in a different state being treated. And the state that we lived in, my income did not qualify us for traditional financial aid. In the state of Michigan, since we weren't residents in Michigan, it did not qualify us for aid as easily. I was like, oh my gosh, if I ever can make it out of this, I really want to set something up. And if I get this business going, I really want to set something up 
to help families that are in a situation like we are. Um, it's, it's hard enough dealing with a critical illness, but it's even harder dealing when you're trying to figure out how am I going to raise money? Um, how am I going to do this? Do you have a GoFundMe? Do you have spaghetti dinners? Do you sell t-shirts or whatever? We did all of that. And it was just like, things just shouldn't be this hard, but it is. It's life. And, and you're trying so to I pay it forward. To, Yes, I wanted to do something to help. There was already a fund set up um, by a nurse that w- that um, was named after a nurse that was at the at the um, that worked there, and I donated that a few times. But you know, as I, as the business started to look like it was going to go somewhere, um, I wanted to set up one in our daughter's name, so we did. Um, it set it up last year in August. Basically, I pledged um, five thousand dollars over three years, just for me. For portions of my sales, I'm donating what I can into that fund, and it goes directly to social workers to help the families to, um, with meals, with lodging, with parking, that sort of stuff that you may not think about because you're worrying about everything else. Well, I think it's admirable what you're doing, and thanks for doing it. I'm sure a lot of families well. are going to get helped and. I hope I'm sure they'll appreciate it too. Yeah, you know, like when when we um, when I first set it up, the social worker team like came up to me and they were just so thankful and it was just like, oh my gosh, you know about it, <laughs> you know, like this, you know, it was already it was already there, you know, the fun was already created and they knew it was there. So, word travels fast. <laughs> Yeah. 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 It's, it's pretty good. And you know, like, and and, you know, I I understand people may not want to buy their gun targets, but, or that sort of thing. But if anybody, businesses wanted to donate and say, you know, um, they need, Hey, we doing at the end of the year, you know, they need to donate to our organization or whatever. That's always an option. You could donate to that and you get a receipt emailed right to you. You get a really nice letter in the mail from the university, um, thanking you, and then you get a t- your tax receipt. Very good. Well, I'm going to start winding this down. I wanted to ask you just two more questions. Uh, the yeah. first thing is I wanted to know what's something that people may not realize about being a pharmacist entrepreneur, because you're doing something outside of your pharmacist identity. I know you're yeah. pulling your intelligence and your ability to educate others into this business, but what's something somebody doesn't realize about being a pharmacist entrepreneur? You know, in school, we were not taught business. And there's a lot, a lot of stuff I wish I would have learned in college (laughs) about business. And so you really kind of have to make sure you know what you're doing when you talk to people um, about the business that you're in. And there's a lot of stuff that you may be thinking, but not know how to communicate to somebody and you run into a roadblock because they're not understanding you, (laughs) you know? So as, as pharmacists, we're taught to educate patients and physicians and, and, and so forth. If you're in a business that's not related to pharmacy, the skills are there. You just have to know how to apply them. And, and that's the biggest thing I would try to get across to someone who goes into a business that isn't related to pharmacy, but they're tying pharmacy into it indirectly. Put your ego aside. That's the biggest thing. It sounds like what you don't know, you can always pick up, right? Right, right. I mean, I I don't know anything about engineering, machining, um, CNC, plasma cutting. I had to learn all that. Um, the basics of it. So I would, I know what the product is going to look like. I know, I know what it means um, when I put it next to a knockoff, you know, or something else that's out there and that somebody tried to copy my design or for, you know, I had to teach myself how to use the drill press because I make all my prototypes myself. What I can't make myself, I have the welder do, but the initial core product, I made my garage all from scratch. Um, from wood and steel. Awesome. (laughs) Way to go. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you just have to not be afraid to do it, you know, but you also got to know your limits. Um, knowing your limits is very, very important. Um, because you can overextend yourself and before you do it, everything starts cascading. Good advice. And thank you for sharing yeah. that. You're welcome. Well, before we wrap this up, is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered? No, I, I, you know, I just really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to everybody. I, I think GPA is, is, is an illness that not very many of us are familiar with being in pharmacy for at the time I was, you know, pharmacist for 23, 23 years, 22 years and never was familiar with it. And it just hit us like a ton of bricks. And I think the biggest thing that everybody can learn is that anybody, anyone who has a child with a critical illness, there are commonalities between you. Don't be afraid to lean on those people, even though they don't have the same illness that your child does. There's a lot of common denominators. And second, um, you know, as, as pharmacists were, you know, some of us are like, everything's about the numbers. Everything's about the numbers, you know? Um, but the biggest thing is it, it's about trending, not just about one number. It's not about two sets of data. It's about a group of data and where it's going. And when you have a situation where it's your own child, it's very easy to lose that perspective um, because you're, you get so emotionally wrapped into it, which you should, because you're a dad, you're, you know, it's your child. You always have to look at the big picture. It's not just about one number. It's about everything. And it's about what you do about it. You know, the biggest, the biggest thing is when you, when you hit a brick wall, it's, it's what defines you is how you react to it. You can be, oh, this isn't going to work and just be, have the most negative attitude, or you can grab it by the neck and say, I'm going to do it. And then you prevail and you have a choice to make. And we chose the choice to prevail. I love what you said just then. You get to choose how you react to those difficult circumstances. You did great. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your story on the Pharmacist Voice podcast. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you for listening to episode 17 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. Please visit thepharmacistvoice.com to subscribe and read the show notes. That's thepharmacistvoice.com.